The heading I suppose you can make over your fresh page is the map of complex numbers. That's what you could call this. Uh, the mind map if you want, but I'm just going to call it the map of complex numbers. Good morning, Aaron. Thanks for joining us. All right, now, um, what I want to do is kind of take you on a little bit of a retrospective tour. We have actually covered a fair bit of this enormous expansive topic. Um, I wonder if you feel that way. You're like, yeah, man, my brain is swimming in this and what we're doing in extension one as well. Not to mention all the rest of my subjects, like the difficult child of English that I'm dealing with. Um, you've learned a lot. And I think it's really important you understand, number one, how the pieces fit together. Number two, um, where we go from here and, and why we go in that direction. Um, so I'm going to do my very best to try and navigate this a little bit for you. We started uh, in lesson one with this thing called the imaginary unit. And uh, you can put it smack bang in the middle of your page if you like. Uh, we called it I. Uh, we defined it sort of as one of the solutions to the equation. And I, you could jot this down if you wanted. Hopefully I'll be able to snag some space in here. Uh, it's one of the solutions to this equation. x squared equals negative 1. Um, we very, very colloquially referred to it as the square root of negative 1, but for reasons that will become a little bit clearer in the next couple of weeks, um, that's probably not the best definition for it. This is the best definition for it. I is one of the solutions to this equation, an equation to which we used to say there aren't any solutions. So we sort of broke out of the real number space uh, into the complex number space, right? Now, where did this go? Where did this take us? Well, the first place was we realized that these imaginary numbers, when you put them together with real numbers, so you've got your real component there, A, um, your imaginary component there, uh, B, multiplied by the imaginary unit. These two things, they fit together and interact with each other, just like irrational numbers do, right? When you've got like 3 plus root 5, these bits interact with each other, but they can't quite mix, right? Which is why we call them complex numbers in the first place that they're attached. And we introduced, you know, a couple of names here, right? We called these rectangular, uh, the rectangular form of a complex number, because when you put them onto, like try and draw where they are, you get a rectangle. And um, we also called them the Cartesian form, and we often write them as x plus i, y. Um, to sort of reference that fact. The x and the y, they tell you where you are horizontally and vertically. And then this took us to a bunch of different places. We had a whole new form of numbers. So the first thing that we did with them was, well, can we do, oopsie daisy, can we do what we uh, do with our regular numbers? Can we do them to complex numbers? So we looked at just adding together, subtracting, multiplication and division. Just the regular stuff, right? We were delighted that for things like uh, addition and subtraction and multiplication, they more or less followed all the same rules that our regular numbers did, um, except that everything ended up being a binomial. So it was a bit messier, but it worked out, right? We did notice, though, with division, uh, it wasn't quite so straightforward. We needed to bring in an extra uh, tool or an extra idea, an extra concept that allowed us to conduct division. For example, um, if, if I asked you to divide 5 plus i by, say, 3 minus 2i, unlike with our normal numbers that we're used to dealing with, you look at this, you're like, I don't know, common denominator, like common factors, cancelling, what does it even look like? What did we do with this number in order to deal with it? Realizing. We wanted to realize this denominator, like the fact that the denominator is complex gives us problems. What was the way that we realized the denominator? What did we do to it? We multiply, say it again, Sean? Yeah, we use the conjugate, right? This was this handy idea, um, which we borrowed back from like algebra, like simple algebra, difference of squares. When you have something multiplied by its conjugate, things, things square out, and that will get rid of the imaginariness and the, the complexity um, of, our, of our numbers, right? So, so that was kind of all within uh, the, the sort of basics as we were just doing the arithmetic of it. But then we started to realize, particularly when you add, subtract, and then we'll get to multiplication shortly, you can actually start to visualize this better, right? If I gave you two complex numbers and I said add them together, I asked you what was the result and its relationship, apart from just number crunching, with what you started with, right? And we started to realize that if you plotted these onto a two-dimensional space, good morning gentlemen, uh, which we called the complex plane, to be distinguished from the Cartesian plane, right? This is not a real number and then another real number. We have a real numbers and then we've got imaginary numbers, right? When we put these onto the complex plane, we started to realize, oh, there's, um, 
there's relationships here. For example, if you could say one complex number is here and another complex number is here, then adding them is like doing one after the other. And where you end up is like doing each as a separate step, right? So we very, very informally um, talked about this idea of a vector. Now, for those of you who are in physics, this is a familiar idea. Um, but for those of you who aren't, we're going to deal with this idea of vectors direction and, and, and distance. We're going to deal with it more within the extension 1 course and the extension 2 course next year. So we'll return to this idea. Then we started thinking a little further about the relationships between um, complex numbers and then how they operate together. Addition and subtraction we could plot onto here fairly easily, but multiplication did something weird. Do you remember that? Uh, multiplying by real numbers takes a number and then it scales it. Do you remember that? And then we notice that multiplying by imaginary numbers does not scale. What does it do? It's a, yeah, it's a rotation, right? It's a different kind of transformation. So when you multiply by a complex number, you do both of those. You scale in some way, you rotate in some way. And we realize that when you're talking about rotation, you're like, oh, this is angles and stuff. And, and rectangular form, Cartesian form, makes understanding angles quite difficult. You've got to do all this extra work, right? So we realized that um, multiplication, you can see I've drawn this arrow here, it leads over to a whole different way to write our complex numbers. This is where we introduced this monstrosity, right? Polar form, uh, mod arg form, trigonometric form, because it's in terms of sines and cosines, right? Uh, now, there's all kinds of ideas that fit underneath this, right? So this argument that we said before, um, we introduced this little form of notation, arg z, which is, which is the theta in there. Uh, we also noticed because you can rotate around a bunch of different angles, like a zero, radians, which is on the positive real axis, give me another angle that would face you in the same direction as zero radians. What could you spin around to get to that? Pi. Two pi radians would get you there, and four pi, and six pi, and on and on and on. So we're like, this is confusing. Let's try to be less ambiguous. So we introduced this idea of the principal argument. Do you remember that? Um, and I've used interval notation here just to remind you of it, because it's from earlier in the year. Um, we said you can go from negative pi to pi. We don't include negative pi, because Negative pi goes, oh sorry, negative pi goes this way, pi goes this way, you end up on the same spot. So it's like, we better work out which one we want. We decided the positive one was better, right? Uh, that's the argument. What's the other piece in mod arg form? Modulus. It's the modulus. And we worked it out using an even older piece of maths, namely, what's that? That's, that's Pythagoras, isn't it, right? Because we're just trying to work out a distance. It's the hypotenuse in a right angled triangle. And I hope you notice that this brings us back sort of, I mean, not quite full circle, um, but the way we get this uh, calculate, this modulus, is we go back to the numbers in rectangular form, real part, imaginary part. OK, so at this point, your brain was like, all right, this is, this is new stuff, a lot of new ideas, but at least you can fit it together in an intuitive way. It relates to the unit circle, which I didn't draw on here. But then we said, from polar form, like we all got rapidly sick of writing R cos theta plus I sine theta. We wanted a shorter way to do it. Um, and the way that we got there was to explore, do you remember this guy? Euler's formula, right? Um, and I gave you, I presented two proofs, one in class and one outside of class, for why this bizarre result is true. That when you raise something to an imaginary power, it's somewhat analogous to when you're multiplying by imaginary numbers. We, that makes sense. Multiplication indices, they're, they're connected together. So we get this rotation around. And, and introduced our third and final form, not rectangular, not polar, but exponential. exponential form. Thank you. So we can write, and this is the most succinct way to write um, a complex number, we can write a complex number in terms of its modulus and its argument, but using the exponential function instead of using all the trig stuff. Okay. Now, interestingly enough, in our last lesson, uh, we're starting to get to the point where you might notice a few of these lines are in purple. That's because we haven't got there yet. Um, but this is sort of the most recent thing we did. We went from exponential form, and we realized, because we know so much about um, index laws and stuff like that, we're quite good at index laws because we've been doing them for years. There's an application of it which brings us back to the polar form, right? It's this one right here, named after a French mathematician. Anyone remember? De, De Moivre's theorem, right? Very good. And you pronounced it right, I'm so pleased. Though some of you were like, duh, de moi, de moi, I don't know how. Yeah, okay. So this result here, right? De Marvis theorem, which we started to look at last time, and we're going to go a little bit further into today. 
Uh, this takes us back into the, the polar form, right? You're like, there's no E's or anything like that. We got it from exponential form. Um, we, we got uh, this guy here from, from Euler's formula, um, but it's all cosines and sines, right? Okay, so take a breath, right? I, I don't know if this is <laughs> better or worse for you to look at all of the knowledge that you've just sort of developed over the last little while and to see it is deeply interconnected. In fact, there's a whole bunch of dotted lines that are missing from this. I could have put them in, but it would just be even more of a mess than it currently is. But essentially what we've done is we've wanted to, Mrs. Lees and I, get you as quickly as possible to these three different forms, rectangular, polar, and exponential. And what you can see is sort of on the periphery, I'm going to have to arrange this better when I redraw this diagram, but as you go further out, there are new applications of each of these which we're going to return to. Um, something over in here which we can look at directly from rectangular form, but we wanted to show you that it's connected actually to exponential and rectangular form. Um, this thing hanging out down here, which actually some of you have already asked me about because you might have encountered these ideas elsewhere, and I've deliberately said no, we're going to wait until later to learn those. But today, and this is the heading you can make on your new page after this weirdo looking map, where we're going to go is something completely out of complex numbers again. We're going to use complex numbers to get there, but it's going to take us back into the real number world, and that is heading trigonometric expansions. We're going to get there via de Moivre's theorem. Okay.